one. We had, on balance, a pretty good weekend with Stony Brook Seawolf Sports. Yes, the Bombers dropped on us last week. But uh, then, of course, all winning streaks do eventually end, and it did for the women yesterday against Maine. But most importantly, the spring sports, well, we'll start with lacrosse because, Greg, you called the game. And uh, this was, well, first of all, you got a great game to call. Okay, you know, for for your baptism of fire, you had a great, a really fun game. Not one of these nineteen to four blowouts either way. Uh, take us through it. Yeah, so it was a uh, it was a good day. You know, we almost had a for a spring sport in February. We actually had a spring day yesterday. Yes, so, mm-hmm. that that did help. Uh, that sure. was... <laughs> and look, how yeah, many but... how many early season lacrosse games got banged because of snow on the field? Several. <laughs> oh yeah. Of course, yeah, for, especially throughout the year. Yeah. So, oh, Seawolf's field was even worse. I mean, Laval Stadium, at least you can plow it away and you get all the uh, ground up tires from the uh, field turf, you know, turning the snow black. But uh, I remember many times, I mean, even there wasn't snow on the ground where it just melted. It was so muddy you couldn't play. You couldn't even play on it. Yeah, the old field. I certainly had some games that were postponed in that regard. But, uh, you know, so Stony Brook comes out and they had Fairfield yesterday and they have a thrilling 13-12 come from behind victory, you know, on the with, I think, 125 or something left in the in the game and maybe mm-hmm. even less than that. Uh, Polinetti hits McCannell on a uh, – Polinetti sweeps hard to the left, uh, and throws it back to McCannell, and McCannell puts it over the goalie's head for the game winner. And it was really, a, a, a first of a well-drawn-up play. We spoke to a Mike after the game. And he had he had said how you know it was something they had seen earlier in the game they had gone back to and they were looking to make that action happen at that point in time. But when you look at it, Fairfield jumped out early. They were uh, they were up four two at the end of the first quarter. They, right. One of their players, Bryce Ford, had an excellent. I mean, he oh, almost had yeah. a season. He had a season in one game. He yeah. was seven and two uh, yesterday. And uh, that he, has to suck for him because you you have the game like that and you lose. Yeah, um, but he was he was impressed with the watch. Fairfield was much, but you know Fairfield, interestingly enough, had it was two and nine last year. But I think it's like a deceptive two and nine. You know they had a lot of injuries and a bunch of players that didn't play. Uh, Bryce Ford being one of them, and they came back from injury, so they were a little more seasoned than you kind of gave them credit for. And I think offensively, Stony Brook felt like they were just going to be have so much firepower that they were just going to overwhelm Fairfield. And that didn't happen in the beginning of the game. Well, you know, they the really firepower had... to save them because, you know, <laughs> Ford was a force unto himself. Yeah. So the, my takes from the game is basically the, the offense was powerful. You know, they as advertised, you know, McCannell, excellent. Polinetti, excellent. I like the player Mac from Michigan. Uh, he's a shifty little guy from X. And I think, this people aren't going to say this about the game. They're not going to realize it. But one of the big advantages that Stony Brook had is they ran three midfields yesterday. Mm-hmm. So Depth. they ran, yeah, they had it in the midfield line, and I think that weared out Fairfield in the second half. You know, I when remember, they were running about four or five minis. I remember where you know, we've had we had, and you've been watching the team over the years as well, where even in their better years, they might be able to run five total midfielders. Yeah, I would agree with that, and that wasn't the case. They ran six. Now they're running nine. Midfield. Yeah, they ran two midfield lines that were really equal to each other, you know, and they each had their moments on the field. Uh, but then they were able to give, a, like, a third group of midfielders uh, an opportunity to run. And maybe they ran five or six times yesterday, but five or six runs, what it does for you in the fourth quarter is it gets you the opportunity to throw your ones out a couple extra times because they've gotten rest so they can go a little bit more. And I think that was a big advantage for them. I, I thought mean, Anthony... That's a big difference between a good team, well, yeah, a high-ranking team and a mid-major team is that it is the depth when University of Virginia can run four lines on you. Right. The only thing I will say is that I don't know if we had um, – they had production. There was a, They had a, that third midfield, I think, was a, was a plus when they were on the field. I don't know if they got any goals directly from those midfielders. No, though. not that I see, no. Yeah, but it was definitely a plus for them. Well, it's like hockey. I thought, it's a checking line. You know? Yeah. yeah. Uh, and it could be and, – and it's and now with the shot clock on lacrosse, too, if you're up, 
it's an opportunity to be, you know, like it almost like when you say in baseball an innings eater. So those midfielders are almost like a time suck a little bit as well, mm -hmm. too, where you can actually grind the game down a little bit with an extra group and rest some of your other guys. Right. By the I, way, I'm curious for you, for you, for just on the coaching perspective, can you talk about the adjustments the Seawolves made? Because, you know, looking at that first period, you know, they had the same amount of shots at Fairfield with 11, but obviously Fairfield outscored them, more shots on goals. They played the better game overall. Even in the second quarter, they outshot Stony Brook 12 to 10, and it really wasn't until the second half to where Stony Brook started to dominate uh, controlling the ball. Yeah, one of the things that changed in the second half is the face-offs became more competitive. Not that Stony Rick was winning the face-off or winning the draw, although they, they started to win a couple more. What they were able to do is they were able to start to fight for some ground balls. And one of the things that people don't necessarily recognize is if, you, if the face-off guy on the other team wins it, if they win it back to the defensive half, you can force them to, rut, to clear the ball. And doing that kills the shot clock. And also potentially gives you an opportunity to steal a goal in transition. So I think that was one of the things that threw off um, Fairfield's offense a little bit is that they were able to turn them back at the face off X, not giving quick offensive possessions and being having the possession for 80 seconds, which I think stalled them up a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, I still think they, they, they scored at a, at a, a pretty good clip. Uh, you know, they were, yeah, but you know, I think it was the fourth quarter. And I think also Stony Brook offensively, they got the ball and they were, they were scoring themselves. And when you get good possessions and you're scoring, you're keeping the ball out of the other team's stick on the offensive end. And I think that was a big deal. I also thought Anthony Palmer came up with some really clutch saves. He had, I think, 14 saves on the day yesterday. And some of them, you know, some saves are more important than others. Some saves are bigger than others. He had a couple down the stretch that were big saves where guys had their hands free, especially like Bryce Ford and Taylor Stroh both had their hands free for shots. And he came up with some clutch saves uh, for yeah, the Seawolves. Ford, Ford and Stroh combined for 9 of 12 uh, Stags goals yesterday. And for Stony Brook, it was Anderson and McCannell that led the way. But yeah, shutting those two down uh, was definitely you know a, a difference maker for sure. And just looking at Stony Brook in the fourth, period, fourth quarter, that's really when they woke up. And I think, too, the defense, you know, they played real good it's in the sense that it was Fairfield making mistakes, you know, causing penalties, uh, being put down a man. And that gave Stony Brook extra man opportunities, which they were able to uh, control the ball with more and potentially capitalize on. Uh, well, they didn't score a goal, but they were still able to control the clock and the tempo of the game. Yeah, and I do agree with you on that, Ken. I thought Fairfield showed a lack of discipline in the second half that could be from fatigue as well too like we had spoken earlier but i just thought the you know uh, discipline wise i thought stony brook kept their cool a couple times we saw some scruffles i mean it's 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 hockey football lacrosse these are collision sports these are you know high risk sports and you get guys that are overexerting themselves and that can lead to some joy and maybe some pushing and shoving i think stony brook kept their cool at those moments when Fairfield didn't, I thought that made a big difference. That's usually a good experience. Yeah, I think they, you know, the, the little bit more of a senior team where you've got guys that are playing together a little more uh, or have just played, in Stony Brook's case, they've had some grad transfers come in who have played elsewhere. Like they have a lot of years. of Yeah, Mac, DeMeo. They've got a bunch of guys. They're, they're the one defenseman from um, Mount Olive, Williams. Um you know, those guys have been around the block before, so they don't take the bait as easily. You know what the else? One thing, I, the one thing they find very interesting, too, is that eight different guys scored for the team. Yep. Okay. I mean, I a couple of guys with hat tricks, and, and Palinetti had two. But the, the he had four points, and obviously the assist that won the game was probably the most important play he made. They, by the way, on StonyBrookAthletics.com, if you want to see the replay of that goal, you'll see how gorgeous it was. It they was – on our Instagram at WSB Sports. Oh, you with, put it up. Great. Yeah, with uh, Greg on the call for that one. Great, because <laughs> uh, I think the, the, the angle on the uh, one that they have on SwingBookAthletics.com was taken from the from the ground, though. But whatever, wherever they got it, it really was a gorgeous play. And it just tells you something else. And this we talked about with uh, Coach Gillardi during the week before the game, is that, you know, Palinetti is not just there to crank it in himself. Palinetti is there to lead the offense when he's on the uh, when he's on the field, and you know if and find guys. Okay, he's not just 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 a goal scorer. He's got to be the assist guy too, and he's got to be the quarterback. And he and he 
perfectly executed that play perfectly and set McCannell up. There was one thing that, that uh, so speaking to when we interviewed Gillardy, Coach Gillardy after the game yesterday, one of the things that he said that, that was really uh, an interesting take was, you know, that he's just one sixth of the offense. Right. And the players have really bought into that attitude of one sixth. And when you look at the stat sheet from yesterday, it's true. A lot of guys had opportunities and a lot of guys produced yesterday. Right. So it wasn't just McCannell. It wasn't just Palametti. It was the the ball was shared and a lot of guys had action and a lot of guys had opportunity to score. So it wasn't like uh, Polinetti was a black hole, got the ball, and it was kind of like stuck in in a stick or McCannell was stuck in a stick. No. Last year. Go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. They had shots and no, they had shots and opportunities, and they, and they took them. And by all means, they should. They're excellent players, but they didn't hold back other players from being successful, which sometimes can happen when you have some dominant players. Last year, you had the feeling, though, in Palinetti's first year, that he wasn't sure what he was supposed to do. Was he supposed to take the shot himself or pass it? He seems to have a better feel for, you know base being in charge i guess because the whole thing is is yeah he's a top scorer on the team he's the best offensive player on the team and in a crunch situation now here's the i'll take you back 10 years okay road game at towson uh we did the game down there this is with with kevin crowley okay it's tied no they're down a goal in the final seconds of the game and they just scored, they get the face off, right? So everybody knows Seawolves going to win the face off because they have the, uh, Adam Rand, the best face off, the Fogo guy in the game at the time. And everybody knows who the ball's going to. Kevin Crowley, of course. In that situation, and again, I asked him after the game, you know, did, could you have got, did you have time to get the shot off? I said, I thought I did, but they, they crowded me. They Everybody focused on Crowley. But in a situation like this, okay, where you win the face-off, okay, you don't necessarily have to go to Palinetti, even though Palinetti may be on the field. Palinetti's there, great. but you know, And Palinetti, he may not have time to pass. That's the only thing. In a situation like that, you've got choices. You've got options. The only problem is you may have too many options and, be, and hesitate. But everybody knew, even with Jordan McBride out there, who was a machine gun, uh, Kevin Crowley was going to get the ball and he was going to have to make the play. Yeah, and you know, yesterday with Polinetti, when he had that feed to McCannell, it was really an opportunity for Polinetti to take a shot. As exactly. Well too. Exactly. His hands were scenario. free. Yep, his hands were free, and he could have he could have let it he could have let it rip at that point in time. Uh, but you know, they, like they said, those guys, either they talked about it as a staff and team, or the two of them talked about it, you know, before they had gotten on onto the field or during a timeout, Hey, listen, if I sneak under, you can, you need to get the ball back to me. And I think I got a shot right there. Uh, and it was something that they had seen earlier in the game that they went back to. So credit to him as a player for doing that and having confidence in the other players on the team. So the, only thing that I would uh, that concerned me uh, defensively was, you know, having Bryce Ford with so many points. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because that was going to be my next point and question to you. Stony Brook's right back at it. Uh, they have coming this upcoming Saturday, the February 19th at noon. They'll be taking out Robert Morris 0-2, lost to number three ranked Duke. You know, almost everyone does. You know, they they lost yesterday to Bucknell 14. 14- their star scorer has been Taggart Clark, four goals against the Blue Devils, five goals yesterday in the loss. What do you do to stop a guy like that who has nine goals in two games after giving up six goals already to the other team's best scorer? Yeah, I mean, he said that he saw a rise in him, and then that brought like he has a as ring, well, does too. He? Yeah, he's got two, actually. He's got two. Uh, and yeah. Mars Tiffany, and again, friendly reminder to everyone who doesn't know this, and who doesn't go that, that far back with Stony Brook lacrosse. Lars Tiffany used to coach at Stony Brook. But like all mid-major schools, people see a talent and he gets grabbed. Uh, he went yeah. back to his alma mater, Brown, and then proceeded on to Virginia. But the the whole, that's just life where we are. It's what happened with Steve Peichel. It happens with other coaches too. What happened with Rick Soule, you know? Yeah. The one thing with Chris that I noticed as well too is physically he's, he's intimidating. Mm-hmm. 
you know, six, especially for yeah, especially six, for the American. Sorry, I was a six one, two hundred pounds. You know, it's a big guy at the midfield, <laughs> and he runs really well. Mm-hmm. And you know, and, and then you add a guy that plays with some tenacity. So I would, I kind of was a, he was a guy that I had in mind when I was asking Coach Gallardi that question. Uh, but now, Matt, we go back to the earlier point that we were talking about with the men's lacrosse is they actually had um, three defensive middies that they were playing as well, too. Um, and I think that was a big help. So now you're looking at you playing not nine middies, but you're playing 12 middies because p- three of them are playing defense. That's great. Right? So you're playing 12 midfielders, you're playing three attackmen, you know, you're playing four plus defensemen. So you really got a lot of use out of your bench yesterday, and that's only going to help them you know, Agreed. moving forward in the year. Yeah, sure. I like, I, I remember, I remember one short stick D midi in particular won a game with an overtime goal at Hofstra, Owen Adams. You probably remember him too from mm-hmm. a few years back. Yeah. But uh, the one thing I love about short stick D middies is that, you know, to be one, you got to be fast. I mean, you got to be able to outrun everybody because you're going to be the guy on the clear. And people would be hacking at you, and, and you basically have to blow by them. Turn on the jets and zoom. But And then after you do all that work, you have to run off the field. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Your I job is done. Outrun everybody and then pass the ball off to an attackman or a midfielder. Yeah, so I think the game next week, Ken, like against Robert Morris, is going to be an interesting one because it'll be, it'll be a good test defensively. Let's see what kind of a stride. I think you make your biggest jump as a team in the next couple of weeks, because you have a game then you have a week off of practice then you have a game and you have a week of practice. Yeah. Two games and, back to back St. John's and either Hoster or LIU, depending on who wins. Yeah. And I thought that, that coach Glardy once again, had an interesting point with that. He's like, you know, Hasha going into this in the CAA, you know, they're doing that long Island championship weekend. And he said, one of the reasons why they were interested in doing that is because it mocks the America East tournament. Mm, that's a great point. And I was like, wow, that really is an interesting point. And then, oh, Joe Spleen does uh, that with the women all the time. Yeah. So it's a very similar kind of deal. And then he said, uh, he's like, but we don't know what we're going to do with the Long Island Championship now that we're going to be common opponents. Uh, I would hope that they'd stick with it. Just you can do one or two things. You could say, you could play Hofstra twice during the season, which, you know, the locals won't mind for sure. And no, I, that's how I, you I build a rivalry right there. You know, yeah, we saw it with I, NGIT. Uh, last year, uh, all you all me obviously, you know, the past few years, you know, uh, you want to get Hofstra Swinbrook fans riled up, you know, have them go against each other twice in a year, twice in a couple months at that as well. Yeah. And you can also or, make or, it a true, even if it is a conference game, you can add some kind of tradition to it, like the old oak and bucket or something like they have in college, uh, the you, uh, something to play for and have it go back and forth. Um, just trying to think of what would be. St- a trophy, a, a token trophy that would be so Long Island, and I'm thinking fish. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. it's got to be a little bit more permanent than a fish, though. That's but, true, right? Uh, yeah, Greg, as you're saying. Yeah, I just think the uh, it would be it would be interesting. Or do you or do you have to or or do we say okay, we're going to play Hofstra, um, the first game of that Long Island championship every year, so you already know what the matchups are going to be. You know, Stony Brook's going to play Hofstra. And that's going to be a conference game, and whoever wins goes on and, and plays in the uh, the Long Island Championship, or you play in the uh, the consolation game. But the, your first game would be against Tasha. I, that probably would be the logistically right. probably would be the 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 most realistic thing to do. But I don't think anybody uh, ever does that. I mean, with these early season uh, weekend tournaments and stuff like that in any sport, whether it's basketball or lacrosse. And lacrosse, they've done it with the high schools too. Uh, the they, they don't necessarily like to uh, you know, make it count as a conference game, whether it's a conference opponent or not. But you can't have it two co- these in the same conference face each other and not count in the conference record. Yeah, I, yeah, I, that's I can't not see gonna how work. that would work. Yeah, it's not going to work. So, or do you play it later? Yeah, you know, it'd be tough to play that kind of a tournament later in the in the season. It's 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 in a good spot right now because it gives you some time to recover. And and for conference play. After well, that. Hofstra, remember that the Hofstra matchup was always the last week of the season, and the yeah. last regular season game was always Albany. So, 
you'd get Hofstra on Wednesday and Albany on Saturday. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. I actually, to be honest with you, when they first instituted those games, I really enjoyed going to that, you know, because it was it was like a, a mid to late April game, right? And it'd be on a Tuesday, Wednesday night. I always liked going to those games because you had a, you know, you had a beautiful, you know, it was like the, the weather had really turned where it was started to be nice right. at night. You know, and you could get to watch a game. And I can remember watching those games. And I can remember the first time that, that Stony Brook beat Hofstra, I believe, was in Laval Stadium. And I remember, I remember there, was a, it. there was a 9-6 game that I remember very well. Yeah. That, that, I, remember, I mean, I had said on the previous Sunday night, if they had held Hofstra under 10 goals, they'd win. And, yeah, they ended up doing that at least. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, but I think, once again, just back to the to the bones of the, the original conversation, good start for Stony Brook. They do. They have a very talented team. I do like the way that they play. Obviously, it's early. They got some stuff that they they need to clean up. And I do like the mission statement for Coach Gallardi. You know, every day we want to be better than what we were yesterday. You know, and it doesn't matter. You know, the the you know not having the the tournament. That is what it is. Now we the only thing we can do is be better than what we used to be. 